that we might see how great is the hope to which we are called. Alleluia. according to St. Mark, the fifth chapter. <laughs> when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet, and besought him, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a flow of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I shall be made well. And immediately the hemorrhage ceased, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone forth from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had been done to her, came in fear and trembling, and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But ignoring what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, he saw a tumult and people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a tumult and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and walked. She was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. works, first of all, in the synagogues. 
And there was general amazement and acclamation at that. But as we know, before too long, most of the rulers of the synagogues, the religious leaders, sort of turned against Jesus. And one of the reasons for that was that he was thought not to give adequate respect to the, the Old Testament purity codes. Now, the Old Testament did social distancing before it was cool. <laughs> we think, first of all, of the lepers, right? They have to keep their distance. They have to shout out, unclean, unclean, in case anyone might come near them. But also, of course, touching a dead body of either a human or an animal made you unclean until you could sanitize not just your whole body, but also your clothes, and also offer sacrifice. Only then would the distancing end. And then, of course, there's blood. Because in the Old Testament, blood is life. And so among the very, the many kinds of uncleanness that can happen uh, relative to blood, one of those is women's menstrual cycle. While the blood is flowing, the woman is unclean, ritually, ritually impure. So these kinds of things were regarded as very important by the kind of rule-oriented leaders of the synagogues. But apparently there's one exception to that. Jairus, by name, he is an archi-synagogos. He's the president of his congregation. And unlike the rest of the leaders and rulers of the synagogues, he puts his respectability and his high position aside and comes and kneels before Jesus. Why? Because he's heard about Jesus and he believes that Jesus can help his little daughter if he gets there in time. She's very sick at the point of death, as he says. And Jesus agrees to go with him. But then it appears that Jesus will not be in time because of his interaction with, with a woman in the crowd. Jesus and his entourage are making their way in a clumped up mass of people through the streets of the town to Jairus' house when all of a sudden Jesus wheels around and says, Who touched me? And his disciples, representing common sense, say, what do you mean, who touched me? There are people all around you. But Jesus knows that a different kind of touching has taken place here. A touching that was made in faith. And so he insists on knowing who touched him, and, and then here comes this woman. A woman who has had a flow of blood for 12 years. Only wealthy people consulted physicians back in Jesus' day, and so she must have been a woman of some means and status. But that's all gone away now. If she had been married, she would have been blamed for the childlessness that would have resulted from her condition and would have been dismissed, divorced. So now, she's weak, impoverished, without status, oh yeah, and unclean. 
It is not permitted for her to go through this crowd where all these people are gathered so closely together. That's a violation of the social distancing rule. And she certainly cannot touch even the clothing of the one who we know already that the demons have called the Holy One of God, Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, she has heard of Jesus. And faith comes through hearing. And she believes that Jesus can help her. After 12 years of suffering. And so, faith casting out fear, she makes her way through the crowd, breaking every rule in the book, and touches Jesus' arms. And knows immediately in her body that she has been. And that's why when Jesus says, who touched me? She comes forward, not perfect faith, in fear and trembling, but in faith. Comes in just as Jairus had kneeled, had knelt before Jesus, putting his respectability aside, so she kneels before Jesus, putting her fear aside, and explains how the, the seed of the word implanted in her had grown into faith. And how God's steadfast love working through Jesus had in fact healed her of her disease and she felt it physically. And Jesus doesn't tell her well, you know, she broke the social distancing rules. You gotta go and sanitize. He says, daughter. He brings her into God's family, daughter. Your faith has saved you. Sesoken from Sozo. Not your faith has made you well. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace and in health and in wholeness. That's what faith does. But of course, this little vignette, this miracle within a miracle of Jesus interacting with the woman with the flow of blood, means, as we know, that he will now not be in time to save that other daughter, Jairus' daughter. Because just as Jesus is commending this new daughter and sending her on her way saved and healed. The people come from Jairus' house confirming Jairus' worst fears. Jesus will not be in time his daughter is there. And Jesus responds with the line that could be the epigraph of St. Mark's Gospel. Do not fear, only believe. You know, Luther, when he had problems, he would say, he'd stop on the street and say, but I'm baptized, as we've been discussing in the, in the adult forum. But my suggestion to you in this year B of the lectionary, this year of St. Mark, is let your little arrow prayer or your you know, thought when you run into difficulty be the voice of Jesus saying to you, do not fear, only do. And Jairus, and Mrs. Jairus, and Jesus' inner circle of the three disciples closest to him go into the little room where Jesus, well, even before then, he goes into the house and sees all of the mourners making a tumult, I love that, and, uh, and weeping and wailing. And Jesus says, oh, she's not dead, she's just sleeping. And the mourners, representing common sense, they know she's dead. They know that dead people stay dead. And they laugh. They laugh him to scorn. They laugh at him. But Jesus pays no attention to that, goes into the little room with those few people. And instead of saying, oh dear, 
I can't touch this dead body. I'll have to clean my whole body, sanitize my clothes, wait till uh, sundown, offer a sacrifice, and only then can I, you know, rejoin the people. He takes her hand and lifts her up and says, Talitha Kumbi, which actually, it's a, it's, it doesn't really mean little girl, it's a term of endearment, it's little lamb. Little lamb, <laughs> arise. And that's a resurrection word, that's the verb hero. And the little girl got up, that's another res resurrection word, anaste. He took her dead hand and lifted her up. She rose. A miracle within a miracle. But what does it all really mean for us? Because lots and lots of people get sick and everybody has to die. So what does it mean that Jesus healed this long-suffering woman and raised Jairus' daughter from the dead? St. Paul, in the midst of his discussions about stewardship in the epistle for today, gives us a line that helps us. He refers to our Lord Jesus, who, though he was rich, became poor so that you might become rich. That's not an early statement of the prosperity gospel. That's a statement of what Luther calls the frelica vexel, the joyous exchange. Jesus goes down into the earth dead so that he might raise us. Jesus takes on our, our sin and our disease and our last and worst enemy death and saves us from all of that. God's steadfast love acting through him. And that is appropriated by faith. We see that already at the very beginning of this story when Jairus kneels before Jesus and says, with respect to our translation, not, please come and make her well, but please come and save her, sofa, from that same verb. So, so, so. These are stories about saving faith. Whether you are a respected leader of your congregation, or a person without money or status, having lost everything, in either case, God may give you the gift of desperation that gives you the opportunity to hear the word about Jesus and respond in faith, saving faith. Faith is the response to the word about Jesus, the word implanted from which the kingdom grows. And we too, hear Jesus say to us, daughter, son, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and healing and wholeness. And he takes our dead hands and raises us up so that we can live in the fruitfulness of our faith now in this life and then awake from the slumber of death in his likeness forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.